Hi, everybody. What's How's up? going, Chad? Good, buddy. How you doing? Good, man. Another another day. Another day. It is another day. You got all your books behind you. You look all smart and sophisticated. It's great. I haven't read them all. I'm gonna be honest. <laughs> There's a couple in there that are just collecting dust. But, <laughs> but no one knows everyone, that. No one knows that. I should have just kept that a secret. How is everyone else doing? Can uh, you all hear us and see us okay? Check out in the question area. Just feel free to let us know. In the meantime, thanks, John. For those of you who might be just joining us this week, I'm going to share uh, the link to access the project files that me and Chad put together. Copy that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thanks, Barbara. Thanks, Jason. Okay. And let us know if you can access that Dropbox link I just put in the chat area. Sweet. Chad, what are we talking about today? Today we're going to be doing, um, well, on the docket, the, the official thing that we're talking about is like audio reaction and form and layer maps as well. Um, but we're also going to talk about shading and form, and we're also going to talk about um, a little bit more about like fractal displacement and spherical displacement in form as well. Oh, that's so awesome. Oh, that's a lot it. of stuff. I'm so excited. And let me make sure. All right. I want to show my screen. Can everyone see my screen okay? I can. Awesome. So just wanted to let everyone know of a few things just before we get our hands on session. Chad, I don't know if you know this, there was some exciting new announcements yesterday in the Maxon world. Did I miss something? What did I miss? So Universe just got updated. So if oh, any of you guys I have, that. Uh, yeah, so there's now three new effects. So if any of you guys use Red Giant Universe, you should check it out. Uh, one of those effects is called Analog, and another effect is called Texturized Motion, which is pretty cool. The third like is Electrify. Thing? Yeah, it's like spot, like stop motion textures, and there, it comes with I think just over ten, and then you can also choose your own custom texture using texturized motion, which is pretty sweet. Awesome. My default is I installed it last night, but I haven't had a chance to play with anything yet. I'm like really curious to see um, like how these effects work and stuff like that. I'm especially uh, curious about analog versus hollow matrix, because it feels like they do kind of similar things. So I'm curious to see like what, what that's about. It totally does. Um, I can tell you like by playing around with analog, Chad, it's, it actually curves your footage by default. So it gives it like that analog mm. tube look like right away. And then you could use like environment oh. maps to uh, which there's some presets which uh, have like a TV room, which is kind of cool. But uh, mm. definitely some fun stuff there. And I think over 200 new presets with typographic and a ray gun. So check that out. And wow. on top of that, awesome. uh, there's a Cinema 4D release too. And a really? new app. Yeah, so it's it's not like... It's a patch to Cinema 4D S24, but okay. you can get that right now. So if you guys have a Cinema 4D or a license, there's a patch to S24 just came out. You should download it now. It's pretty sweet. Cool. Fine. And then just checking the question area, everyone was able to access that link I just sent in terms of Dropbox. You can download the files for week four. And last, besides this exciting event that uh, me and a chat are a part of, in part four of hands-on with particles there's uh vfx and chill which happens or is happening on june 25th not to mention uh the beginner cinema 40 workshops as well part five is next week june 30th and then we are also on part five chad with hands-on next week where mm -hmm. we take these particles from after effects to go inside of uh, cinema 4d pretty mm -hmm. cool stuff yeah and we are also recording these hands-on sessions. And if any of you guys have access to the Maxon training team, you can go to that website. And uh, it's a private link. So I'll be sharing it with you. It's unlisted. And feel free to check it out a few hours after this webinar. You'll be able to access week four. But right now, there's a week one to three up for everything that we've covered so far, and which brings us to this point. And thanks for letting me know, uh, Jason, that you were able to download that as well and also eric thanks guys awesome 
I will, uh, Chris, yes, I will post that Dropbox link again in a second. In fact, I could probably just can I copy and paste it here. This is the ultimate question, Chad. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> I'm going to go with a, I, I would have assumed probably, but uh, I have failed so far and just copying and pasting a link. <laughs> Hopefully this is not a sign of things to come. And uh, what I'll do is just grab it here from my Dropbox. So that link uh, for everyone, I'm just copying the link and putting it again in the chat area. You should be able to access that uh, Dropbox with our exercise files. So as Chad, you were mentioning mm -hmm. all about the fact that we're going to be talking about a lot about layer maps and uh, yes. believe it or not i was doing some uh, google searches about layer maps and uh your name showed up about 500 times so, uh, <laughs> so on, the, on the forum website about talking about layer maps so it's kind of awesome to speak with someone you wrote the um the form book as well right just in terms of the manual Am um, I correct? yeah a few versions back but yeah yeah so we're like this is so cool that uh, we're able to sit with you here and and chat about uh, experiences with Inform and how we can use things such as layer maps inside of Form to manipulate particles. Oh, now, Chad, thank you. I think it was in week one you were talking about um, the differences between trap code, particular, and form. Mm -hmm. And for any of you who weren't there, you can check out the YouTube page. For those of you who were there, you'll know just that Inform particles are static by default, and in me looking at these particles right here inside this composition, we sort of get this grid of three particles separated in Z space. Just uh, if you're following along, you want to open up the Earth Start composition once you've downloaded the exercise files, and that's going to be in the Nick folder because I'm Nick in the Comps folder. So just double click the Earth Start, you're going to see a fantastic preset version of form staring right at you. So before we started talking about layer maps, Chad, I thought it would be interesting to talk about something that used to be called quick maps. And we've sort of been using maps in particular, if you would agree with me, in mm -hmm. terms of being able to control particles at various points in their life using graphs inside a particular. So this might have been the velocity over life graph or changing the size of particles over their life, or basically having them born visible, and then they die and are invisible at that time too. You have these same type of maps uh, when it comes to, to trap code form, and they used to be called quick maps, but the terminology has just kind of changed. Am I correct, or do you, do you still refer to them as, as quick maps? In my, I mean, officially they're called curves, but like then that's kind of confusing. Um, yeah. So yeah, I still call them quick maps sometimes, but the official name is curves. So now that we've got the, the curves definition behind these old things called quick maps, which is just to basically provide a value to um, the properties of a particle on a, I guess the definition would be on some sort of a map. So to take a, a look at that, actually inside this earth comp, I'm going to go to the layer menu. We're going to add a camera to the scene. And... Uh, I always just love attaching a camera right away from the layer menu to an orbit null. And that just allows us to press the R key and sort of rotate around our default form-based system. So here on the form layer that's included, I will go inside the designer. And now under several of these blocks, such as the size block, you have these options for curves now, which used to be those maps. To simplify at least the introduction to maps, I'm gonna go back to the type box grid. I'm gonna minimize the amount of particles that are currently in the Z axis. So now we just have one box grid of particles. I will choose to make the size of this a bit bigger. Let's go with a thousand. Now in looking at this grid, in order to control the value of the size over this grid, we can choose from a number of preset curves or what used to be called maps. And the way that we activate that would be to choose a size over option in this size block. So if I come down here and choose size over X, 
nothing quite happens just yet. And that's because I need to control the size of these particles in form by drawing or playing with curves on this graph. One way to, to do that, I'm actually a big fan of going to this option with points, this Bezier curve map. And while we're changing the size of our particles over X, I'm going to drag the point at the very end here, all the way down, and then also drag this point all the way down as well. And Chad, remember what I was talking about last week? If you ever use this, these curves, sometimes you get on the block residue yes. <laughs> of right those particles. So it's always worth, in my opinion, kind of trying to click on this area. Uh oh. Let's uh, hope this doesn't crash because you might just have to take over for a second, Chad. Okay. But uh, it's always worth checking that map. I had a little crash here, unfortunately. Just to make sure that those particles are um, going to be mapped correctly. And if not, the other thing you can do is go to the writing on the size there and be able to check that as well. So give me a second as I sort of restart my screen. You wouldn't have an example of this inside of your comp to to show something similar? Um, I will be covering that like a little bit later, but when we get into audio react, so it's kind of like buried kind of deep. It would take, some, it. It would take some setup. Okay. So bear with me a second as my After Effects hopefully now behaves for me. <laughs> so uh, the, the same thing, but like pretty much all of those block properties, Chad, they all have curves that we can we can access, right? And we can basically dictate the size of particles by mapping it on one of three dimensions, X, Y, or Z, or even in form in some cases in a radial perspective. And mm -hmm. this can be very powerful by itself. It's a great way to get started with with particles in general and be able to control how we visualize how big they are over their life. But I would say also that that- bonus for like the uh, the tip, extra shout out to the tip you gave last week that the designer gives you a more accurate preview in the block thumbnail than you get in even like the UI. So like when you're actually looking at the curve, it's not as accurate as the thumbnail in the designer is. So I, I never knew that before until you taught me that last week. That's fantastic. Oh, thanks, man. Changed my life. I appreciate it. I'm a new man. <laughs> a new man. A new man this week. Cool. <laughs> so, uh, so I'm back to this uh, just amazing box grid, and uh, let's let's just try to replicate this. I'll I don't think I'm seeing your back. screen. Is anyone else seeing your screen? Oh, hold on. Look at that. Did you just see what happened? I just Nailed turned on my screen. I know. <laughs> I'll uh, go back to mapping these uh, the size of these particle changes over X. I'll go back to my size curve tool where I will repeat what I just did, dragging these two pen tools down. Again, we don't have, again, this is the most accurate, like you were mentioning, Chad, version of your graph. And I, you can see here when I clicked up in this upper left-hand corner, I was able to now bring those down. And we can control the size of our particles to be absolutely zero here on the edges of this grid. And then they're at their full size of two up from here to here, pretty much. Of course, we can change that even further by playing with the size so it's half the size of what we put it to be here in terms of the size value. And then even play with uh, forms of randomness which aren't referencing the graph to create some really interesting patterns inside a form. And I think that in the preset section, we've taken some great looks at presets inside of particular, but I would say, in my opinion, some of the presets inside a form are awesome. There's one subtle difference that we should know at the time being as well between the two, is that in particular, all of your presets are in one place. They are in one place in form, but they're spread out over two tabs. So you have tab one, which is your uh, single form presets, meaning they're of just one, we could consider one system, 
Or then you have multi-form presets, which have multiple forms here. And under them, I think there's some great examples of various kind of cool shape backgrounds that you can create that would show how these curves are being used across uh, the grid or the shapes that were created inside a form. I also think that in looking at the presets, if you head to the fluid category, because we, we finished with that last week, there are some beautiful differences between uh, fluid-based systems that can be seen here in form compared to particular, where in a lot of these examples, you know, you don't have that birth of particles. You just start right away with a simulation. And uh, it can create some pretty unique and beautiful fluid-based movements here. Cool. Okay, I'm just gonna backstep a second, but I thought that was a great place in order to check out those type of quick maps. And now we can sort of move into what I would consider if you're looking for more control than curves, one way to do that is to create your own references slash maps to dictate something about your form particles. And in other cases, you can basically use maps as a way for mapping uh, movies or even still images across the surface of your particles. And nothing is, is truer than, than setting up something here in form where we can use uh, something as simple as a flat map as a reference uh, to put on our form-based particle system. So in fact, I'm gonna just reset form here. I'll give it a second with my lovely spinning wheel. And after it finishes recalculating and bringing us back to stage one here in form, where I'm going to go to right away is into layer maps. And in this instance, I just have a flat JPEG equ rectangular image of the Earth. You can grab this from a number of different places. And I just want to reference that uh, to be on the grid of these particles. And one way to do that is to go to the color and alpha section. And here we can reference the flat map. Now, nothing happens just yet. So what do we do in instances like this, Chad? We uh, change the map over, and I, I get really mad first because I forget, and then I remember, oh, yeah, got to change map over. I was going to say go home, so I think your answer <laughs> was was way better. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, okay, yeah, go uh, change the map over, and I've now mapped these uh, particles in X and Y. However, we can consider this to be like a projection, and it looks weird for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm gonna grab a camera like we did before because I reset the scene, and then now attach that camera again to an orbit null. So we can clearly see that we have that Earth map being projected or its color being projected on our grids. So to sort of get a better representation of that map, if, if it was our goal to have this flat map, one thing that we could do inside a form is find out the dimensions of the flat map. In fact, I'll just reveal it here inside my project and show that it's a 703 pixels by 351 pixels. So we could enter that size of the map inside our base form where rather than have the size linked as XYZ, we can go XYZ individual and tap the numbers, uh, those individual numbers that I just mentioned in X and Y, 703, 351. We should see uh, 351, let's try that again. That the map is now much spread out much better in terms of over these form-based grids, over this form-based grid. Now, if we just wanted one of them, right, this map projection, if we go back to form, we can go to the particles in Z and then just press one. But what we probably want is not a fat, flat map at all. And in fact, this is where we can go to the base form and choose something like a sphere. And then based on the size of that sphere, in fact, I'll just actually go XY linked right now, because this is gonna be a better 
view of a sphere versus have those individual coordinates, we have our equirectangular map mapped to that Earth. It's not looking so bright though, and this has everything to do with how many particles are being generated on our face form. So if we went up to the particles in both X and Y and increased this to something like a thousand, it's almost like we're viewing the actual image, right, Chad? This The thing is that the particles are so yep. close together, we can't even really differentiate them in this instance. But if you, you might be able to, if you zoomed in here with your position coordinates, uh, go in onto the earth, not, not even, and start to maybe see some of those individual particles, but you're better off just bringing down the values in both X and Y to create a particle look. And this all just comes from a map reference. We can take this map reference, this color and alpha, and use it in a number of different ways. But right now we're just using the RGB values of the flat map to basically uh, map those colors onto our base form object. So Chad, when you t uh, use layer maps, what do you find yourself using them for most of the time? Um, it all depends. It's kind of like a special case, like usually like a case by case scenario. But like, yeah, a lot of times I'm doing something like this, like what you're doing here where I'm coloring the particles. Um, I, I use the alpha a lot. Like a lot of times, like I'll use the alpha map to like control exactly where I want particles or if I want to fade in a certain um, way or whatever. Like I've, I've used them for a bunch of different things, but those primarily color and alpha is what I'm using them for. So primary color and alpha is what you're using them for. And then uh, we get this kind of like cool map here of, of an earth. We could bring all types of equirectangular images in. In fact, if you go to a NASA chat, I sometimes will just find an equirectangular image of a planet and that's like perfect. If you're trying to build a form-based system using those maps, which happen to be quite big in terms of their size inside of trap code form and creating some really interesting type looks just by using that. So NASA is a great place to go. It is a great place to go. Stuff, I've, yeah. it's, it's, it's pretty awesome when it comes to uh, resources and, and how you can use that in both form as well as in Cinema 4D. Now, the thing is, you know, this color and alpha is like one of several different maps, right? You've got maps for displacement, size, fractal strength, disperse, rotate, the list goes on. And I would say one of the biggest differences between the maps in color and alpha compared to all of these other categories is your color and alpha map would be, well, the color of an image. <laughs> While displacement maps and the size map and the fractal strength map all use contrast, black and white luminance values to dictate how much displacement might take place on your base form. Let's see this with a, a pretty pretty cool example, in my opinion, and then we can take a look at an, another example at the end. So there happens to be a project here called Layer and Displacement Exercise Start under uh, Nick in the comps folder. So you can double click to open that and surprise, surprise, it is another you know, basic form system, but there's one difference between this and uh, the other projects and that is that there's a still image in here. I grabbed this still image off a site called Unsplash. It's just a, a, a beautiful shot of a, a sculpture here. And I used some tools to uh, quick selection it as well as the object tool in order to make sure that there was an alpha channel behind it. And essentially I would like to have this object, which if we took a, a look at that uh, by typing in MAR, we'll see that it's quite large, it's 4,000 by 6,000 pixels, but we wanna keep these dimensions in mind for when we map um, her to this grid of particles. So let's keep that in mind. I'm actually gonna go here to form and on the form layer, open up form. Uh, let's actually turn off the still and head inside our layer maps. I'll go inside of color and alpha 
And let's choose that still, the Mariana cutout. What should we do, Chad? Uh, change the uh, map over. Yeah. I love it. X, Y? I was like, oh, oh crap, no, it's broken. And I always have to remind myself, <laughs> oh, wait, yeah, got to do that thing. And there's an extra actual level to this too. In fact, you'll see that the functionality by default is set to over RGB, which isn't us basically considering the alpha channel included. So we just want to change the functionality to RGBA. Now we have, just like before, this statue as a grid of particles inside of form, but mapped in uh, three different base form systems based on the box grid. So let's make a few changes. I'm going to change the particles in Z to one. Now we just have one. And I'm going to go to XYZ individual for the size. And while this is quite big, we could start with it uh, 4,000 by 6,000. We're going to get this massive object. And we can use the camera in this instance to uh, dolly out of that object so that we have a better view of the overall grid. So let me get a coordinate uh, for you to use so that we can see this a bit better. But I'll actually go to the position of the base form and use that instead. I'm not getting some, I, I think I have the camera turned off, that's why. Ah. So that's fine. I'm uh, scrubbing the position value in this case to 5,000 pixels in Z. And it might like look like anything on my screen, but there are these small particles that are making up that image. This is really going to come down to now going to those particles in X and Y and cranking up these values. So I'm going to set this to a value of 1500 on both X and Y. Now look at that, Chad. What do we got here? Love it. Statue. It's great. We have a statue. It's a statue of, uh, of particles. And in fact, I'm going to take the position value in Z inside of form and set it on a value of 10,000 out so that we can see that grid. So here's one part of this. That's kind of cool. But if we were to rotate, if I were to rotate this on the Y axis right now, what do you see, Chad? Um, it's flat. It's like a postcard in space. It's a postcard in space. There's like no dimension to this and it might be really handy for us to have if we can see this a little bit of dimension in case we moved around it there's a few different ways that we could achieve this uh, but we're going to do a basic form of this right now so you're going to turn on the photoshop file of the image that you have and we're going to duplicate it by pressing command d on a mac or control d on a pc just to name this duplicate Photoshop file, let's call it uh, displace. Does that sound like a good word, Chad? Very good word. It's one of my favorite uh, words. I like that word. <laughs> and uh, we, just for the sake of quickness, although Chad's going to share with you a method that I know I've seen you use in Photoshop, I'll select an effect called Lumetri color. And we can actually use this Lumetri color effect for a few things. We'll go into the basic correction area where we'll set the saturation to be zero, um, which will make the image black and white. And the next step is if we wanted to have, now we can see that this map of black, white, and gray values can be used to dictate which particles are going to be closer in Z space and which particles are good, and then other particles are going to be further away. If we wanted there to be, we could see that we're moving from white values to gray values to black values. If you wanted that to be more contrasty, we could play with the contrast value here. And now we have almost these extreme values on this image, which it's going to reference to place particles closer and then farther from the camera. So now that that's set up, Let's turn off the displace Photoshop file. Now we're back with form. Hello, form. And in the layer maps, I'm going to close out the color in alpha and let's go to displace. 
Here in displace, the functionality is it's going to take the RGB values of the image, the Photoshop file, and map it to the XYZ of our form system. Now, first thing, let's reference the layer. So that will be the displace layer. That displace layer, we have effects on it. So we'll make sure that it's also seeing the effects and masks. And like Chad has recommended to us a few times, we're going to make sure that this displacement is mapped over a, a particular set of um, coordinates. We're going to set this to X, Y. Now, by default, this is not going to look great. And in fact, we're going to change this slightly where we can go to the functionality. Right now, it'd be best if I rotate around this uh, temporarily in Y space so we can see what's going on. Chad, do you, do you kind of see the displacement taking place? Yeah, you got a little bit of depth there. We got a little bit of depth, and that's based on the displacement amount. And if we were to increase this strength for displacement to something like 500, we're going to get quite a bit of displacement. That's a little crazy, but let's go like now down to 150. So if we take a look, we can see that certain values here in her chin that um, are being pushed forward, other values kind of around her hair are being pushed back. Then we can see also this grass patch down here, which is darker, is being pushed backwards as well. And the cool thing is, no matter how your image is mapped in terms of black and white, you can always come down here and invert that map, right? So now it's the exact opposite of what we had before. Other values are now being pushed forward based on that black and white map. Other values, and then the opposite values are being pushed backwards. So we have those cool two levels of displacement versus having to go back to our original file and then you know, add an inversion. We could just do that directly here with our dispersed value and then have control over the strength of those particles. The other thing we could do uh, in the functionality is just set this to individual XYZ. And rather than have these particles be dispersed on the X axis, the Y axis, and the Z axis, is just set this to Z. So I'll go to the marina, sorry, the displace layer on the layer for Z, go to effects and masks. And we have a much more controlled displacement here on just that axis. Now, Chad, if you were trying to do something, uh, if you're wanting to work inside of After Effects uh, with displacement, one thing you could do to sort of smooth out the transitions between pixels that are being pushed back and pixels that are being pushed forward is to just simply add a blur. So I can come in here and add a Gaussian blur. I'll place it after the Lumetri color, and I'll make that blur 50. We should start to see that there's a almost a smoothing out in terms of the displacement. The other thing we could do, I really pushed up the contrast here for the black and white values, and actually minimizing that contrast to be a lot less, you'll have a smoother displacement overall on your image. So we could even change those black and white values to be closer to gray, so to speak. But using this combination, we can heavily change uh, the displacement and how we transition from one form of displacement to another. Chad, I've seen you in the past in some exercises, specifically with After Effects, just in general, where you've used displacement maps, but you've gone into Photoshop, if I'm correct, and actually use uh, paint brushes to paint black and white on the image. Am I? Yeah. Is that the method that you use? Yeah, typically. I mean, I think this is a cool trick too. And, and also like the regular standard way with displacement map doesn't give you particles to fit it with. But yeah, if I'm going to like take a photo and try to make it 3D, I'll usually do that. Yeah, so you'll do that. And then you can do that. You can use Photoshop to get a more accurate displacement if you're looking for very specific parts of your image to be in front and uh, behind the camera. But right now, uh, this is starting to look a little bit more alive. Uh, we're going to increase the particles in a bit, but I'll actually settle on a strength value of 300 right now for my displacement. And uh, yeah, there we have our displacement section. 
Now I want to go to another section. But again, in terms of layer maps, we can start to play with size. But I think things start to get really interesting where we talk about fractal strength and disperse. These options, you would have to identify a layer, right? Um, to basically act as your map for dispersing particles or adding a, a fractal noise to run through them. But the controls for that disbursement or fractal strength are actually controlled in the subsections down here. So unlike displacement and color or displacement where you had a value that you can drag, these two sections we actually have to dig into the disperse and twist section to get control over that. And then we have to go and dig into the fractal field section. So let's actually uh, deal with disperse first because it's a pretty cool thing that we can work with. And I'm actually going to go back to my original Photoshop image and I'm going to duplicate it again. I'm going to call this duplicate disperse. I want to turn that disperse image on temporarily. And let's just use uh, After Effects' pen tool to basically draw close, not too close to the edges of this sculpture so that basically we have the dispersed particles in an area that we specify using a mask. I'll do that. And while this, you know, this edge dispersion can be probably done with a quick map, you can get a lot more accurate by using these masks, wouldn't you say, Chad? Like oh, the only yeah, problem with sure. a quick map is like you're basing it on X and Y values, and then you're guessing exactly where you put that point in the quick map. But oh, here, yeah. you can't get like this custom shape. Yeah, I can make this. Look how long that took me to make that shape, right? It's like no, but, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, now we've defined an area, and it really doesn't matter. But I will invert that area just to specify this is where I want particles to be dispersed. And I'll even uh, come in here under the mask and add some feather by pressing the F key. Right, so that's now on that new uh, disperse layer. Cool. So this again, by the way, it's not looking at the color of this image. It's looking at it in black and white. So you might just want to make this uh, desaturated just so that you know uh, the values that it's currently looking at the object. But if it, if it's the case that you want to make sure that each of those particles are treated equally in terms of uh, its dispersion, we could uh, add a fill to this, and then just make sure the fill is close to a solid white color. And now you have this is the map that it's essentially reading that transition from black, or the alpha in this case to gray to to white. Okay, I'm going to go into form, turn off this dispersion layer, hop back into the layer maps, and under the disperse category. Chad, what should I do? Uh, well, you want to choose the map and then map over. Change the map over. Okay, See, I'm map learning. Over. This is good. This exercise is like boot camp. And uh, I'll I'll make sure maybe effects and masks. What do you think? Oh yeah. And nothing happens again. So this could be a point of frustration, but that's because we haven't added any disperse value, right? So if you head into the disperse section and we start to increase it, you're going to be seeing a bit of dispersion specifically on that uh, section that I masked out, which is pretty cool, you know? And to me, this might, there's something about the fact that we didn't have it filled where you have the masked area and then you have these black, white, and gray values, which would actually change up a bit of the dispersion as well, which I think is pretty sweet. So something to play around with. And then we could also use the exact same set of values um, inside our layer map for something like uh, fractal fields. So heading into our layer map section and going to, sorry, fractal strength, choosing the disperse 
effects and masks. Map it over. Should I, should I do it, Chad? Yeah. Do it. Okay, I'll go do X it. and Y. And uh, now we can head into the fractal field. Let's play with, uh, oh, look at that. There's a displace value too. See what happens. I'm going to play also with the size value. Hopefully something happens. Did I forget something? Chad, what did I forget? I no, probably forgot something. Do you need more displacement? Oh, no, you know what? It's just oh, my system. Oh, gotcha. But now we can see we've answer. completely made a mess of her hair. Not my intention, so I'm going to bring down that effect size. But we do have still a displacement or a fractal field running through this. And hopefully with my um, change play right here, it's like at five frames per second, we should be able to see some of the animation of that uh, displacement take place uh, if we introduced a bit of like a flow. Let me add some flow here and see if that updates. But overall, like this, there's just so much control that we can have by specifying maps with masks. And in fact, uh, Hashi has such a great example of this on his uh, show Cheap Tricks, Chad, where he uh, he broke down a few of the frames from um, oh, Wakanda. Why am I not remember Black, Black Panther? Panther. Yeah, yeah, and he uh, he took some images directly from that Marvel film and used trap code particular to have some like fractal fields and noise run through it and added he basically shows the process in Photoshop of creating a displacement where um certain pixels are going to be in front of the camera and certain pixels behind. But a mm. super cool effect to see. The only other thing that I wanted to mention, I know that you're going through this as well, Chad, is you know, when I saw this image, this is like perfect use of where we can take all of our hard work and why not replicate this? And I'm just going to go here to this kaleidoscope section where something so unique to form and not particular where we could just take what we've done and just choose to add something called the mirror mode. Me setting this vertically, we already have this weird looking shape, but the minute that we start to play with the center X to move the duplicate over we should eventually see these two statues apart from themselves maybe i'm not dragging the right value i think he's trying to update i mean you got like a million particles i know you what's know, its problem you got a lot I, so this is uh where one thing that could be really handy is to just not reference the original size of this like me just trying to find the dimensions of the actual particle system and bring it down to something a lot more manageable like a thousand by three thousand is going to go a long way here and then we could just of course zoom in on those objects so yeah I already see i got a little bit of better performance just by simply changing the size x and y without actually losing the dimensions of this. I'll go back and then just play with the position of the kaleidoscope so that we have that sort of mirrored image here, which I think looks pretty cool. Now I have a, another composition here, another two, Chad. One is of course with this at more an end point in the exercise where there's just literally a 3d camera rotating around these layer maps so we can see some of the crazy displacement taking place and dispersion uh, we can see the mirrored effects and uh, also just how i added more of a contrast look i actually then relied on two uh, effects from universe chad like a, just to play with different fields and one was like chromatic aberration because why not right <laughs> but it just yeah, adds yeah. A, a little bit of red uh, green and blue and if this wasn't rotating we get the added benefit of a texture um, that looked kind of cool for this sort of broken down sculpt look and the other thing i just played with and could use with some more playing is uh this prism displacement and by itself, without the uh, chromatic aberration, kind of created some interesting, almost rainbow, red, green, blue breakup effects, referencing 
the same displacement channel uh, that is being used by form, but adding another layer of color that you wouldn't get quite that exact same look uh, inside a form. So pretty cool just sort of showing that uh, result and playing around with that sculpting image and just with a little bit of work and having that alpha channel being able to create some displacement, some changes in the size of each of these particles, their size is also changing. And then you have that dispersion controlled exactly how you want to all through the process of mapping. I love the way that looks. Like I love the depth that you pulled out of that. That's really cool. Yeah, it looks kind of cool. And the displacement is definitely shown when you rotate around the whole thing. But even if you wanted to control the camera, like 45 degrees, you could still get some pretty great looking results. Now, yeah, much um, faster than modeling it too. Yes, totally, right? Unsplash, let me tell you. <laughs> what a great site for like uh, free stock if you haven't used it. Oh yeah, I love and it. You might remember this. Uh, we had a few months ago, a webinar series on FUI. And this jumps back to the idea of just using curves where this system that I basically was inspired by a HUD designer by the name of Robin, ha Robin Haddo, who did a lot of work um, on Atman and a ton of Marvel films. What I did here, if we look in form, is this is an eight or, or six form-based system. But these are just using simple maps where I'm controlling the opacity of particles to not show up uh, over these two spherical fields, which you're going to get into, Chad. Well, this mm -hmm. is one form of mapping. And now I'm like thinking to myself, oh, wow, you know what? That would have been way easier just to use a layer map, right? Where this whole area is colored specific around this region with a mask, right? To prevent particles from uh, being born in the section versus just to try to do it with an opacity curve, which took quite a bit of fiddling to do. The only mm -hmm. benefit of that is I was able to do that all inside of the designer. Mm. Cool. And um, let me cancel this here. And I just want to go back to the statue to show some of the 3D angle or perspective of the statue. It's pretty thin here, but with a bit more displacement and playing around, we could get even more 3D depth on that image. Yeah, I feel like if you push it too much, that it kind of like destroys the illusion. I feel like the best effects are created by just giving those like those subtle cues because it's it's obvious when you pan the camera around a little bit, orbit it, like you can tell that it's 3D and like being tasteful about the depth is wise, I think. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Uh, Drake had a, a question. I think he was talking about the new Redshift with Asus, which is not going to be a topic on today in terms of After Effects, but we do have some Cinema 4D guests in week five and six, which uh, they might be able to answer some of that Redshift questions in terms of also particle workflows. So definitely stay tuned for that. Oh, and James, this uh, site where I got this image was directly on a site called Unsplash. And it has free stock there uh, as long as you give and they only re recommend, of course, that you give contribution to the, the author, but you don't have to for commercial work. The other, uh, by the way, these are included in the project files, so you guys can break this down a little bit further. The only other thing I wanted to show, because we did a few things when it came to um, form, and while this is a more simple example, this is an idea of a layer map being used on a, a spherical particle system where text is just being used as the alpha to kind of make a, um, a cookie cutter image outside of this sphere. So there's ways of using layer map in those contexts as well. And in fact, if I head into the form system that's currently being referenced inside this composition, form layer map alpha, 
and we looked in the layer map section, uh, you can see that the functionality of this is currently set to alpha to alpha, which is looking at the text layer, the trap code text layer, and that's causing those particles to be invisible where the text is while still wrapping around that spherical element. Versus if you set it to just RGB, or it's now gonna actually create a mask out of that spherical shape. So that's just another way I thought when you could think about using the color in alpha with layer maps to achieve some pretty interesting type looks inside of uh, inside of trap code form. Cool. And yeah, the last thing I wanted to show, Chad, you might have remembered this from a few months ago before I handed over to you. This comp is a little heavy, but this uh, shows an example of just a simple earth map but then combining a bunch of HUD components inside of Universe, uh, as well as some audio reactions that take place as well. So you can dissect this. Uh, this is using this as the main form element, along with some hollow matrix to create that scan line look. And then we have a bunch of HUD components, uh, in this case arcs, that are roughly the same radius as the form base form. So it appears like it's going around the object. So definitely take a look at that in the files. And that's what I had to show uh, regarding layer maps, Chad. Sweet, buddy. Love it. Let me let me hand this over to you, Ed. Okay. Here we go. Show on my screen. Uh, let's see. Can you let me know when you could see that, Nick? I can totally see the upside down. Okay, perfect. Yes. Okay, so um, I'm Chad. So go into the uh, Chad folder if you're following on with the uh, the exercise files there. And in the Chad folder, you'll find the comps folder. And in that, uh, we're going to be in the fields folder to start off with. And we're going to be talking a little bit more about fractal fields. We've mentioned them throughout this uh, month as we've gone through these things. But I kind of wanted to dig in just like a little bit deeper, get a little bit more specific because they're so helpful. And then we'll move on to some uh, some new territory, which is pretty cool. So uh, if we go into, you don't have to do this, but I'm going to go into 02B upside down final. And this is going to be kind of like what we're making here. Uh, as I preview this, you can see these kind of like, um, little flashes of uh, stuff here. And this is like rendering and it's like really beefy. And initially I did this in eight bits. So it actually doesn't look as good, but I'm in 32 bits per channel for this uh, particular project. So we're getting a little bit extra red in the background that I didn't intend, but it still looks pretty cool. So whatever, but we're seeing these little flashes of these gorgeous shapes and form is just uh, an expert at these shapes and creating this kind of like silky, uh, look, I have this uh, hooked up to an expression, so the um, the uh, the fractal stuff is kind of like flashing on and off. And uh, now my computer's freezing. Today is cursed. Anyways, uh, so you can see kind of like what's going on. So like I have a, a, an expression controller that's making the background flash and the form flash at the same time, so it creates this kind of creepy like, you know. Thing. So this is kind of like what we're going to look at is like how to create these kind of like really interesting gorgeous shapes with form because if, if you're anything like me when you open up form and you see like all those like just dots oops sorry uh, you see all those dots everywhere uh, it's kind of like well how do I go from those dots to this kind of like silky magic and it's actually a pretty cool trick so we're actually going to be working in the zero to a upside down composition and um, it's basically the same thing as the other one, except that we have form and form is just the, the default settings. So I'm gonna go ahead and click this little solo icon to solo this form layer so we could really like more clearly see what's going on. And the first thing I'm gonna do is I just wanna change the color um, because it sounds weird, but a lot of the magic in this trick, it can be seen more clearly if we change the color from the default white. So um, actually what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unsolo this for a second and then I'm gonna go into the particle section, which is where we change the color. And in the particle section, there's the color property with an eyedropper. So I'm gonna click on the eyedropper and select one of these kind of like teal colors in the background. And I'm gonna take some artistic liberties with it. I'm gonna click that color swatch and maybe punch it up just like a little bit. So it's a little bit 
brighter. We don't have to make it like really bright. Eventually we're gonna make it this bright, but for right now, we can keep it kind of like dulled a little bit. And I also wanna draw your attention to something else in the particle section, one of the default settings, and that the blend mode is uh, set to add by default. So as these particles overlap each other, by default in form, they're going to brighten and create little pockets of light, which is really cool. Sometimes you don't want that, so you might wanna go in and turn it off, but really, realistically, um, that comes in handy all the time and it adds a lot to this trick. So again, in the particle section, all we did was change the color. Now, if I open up Fractal Field, uh, we've talked about this already, but there's a this invisible fractal noise field in the background that we could use to do all kinds of things with our particles. We could use them to affect the size. So as we increase this, then we're actually scaling some of these particles down based on the fractal field, et cetera, et cetera. We could do the same thing with opacity, but really the magic here is displace. And as we increase this, then these particles displace and you can see them start to move and as they overlap then they create these gorgeous little pockets of light these gorgeous lines there and i know we've talked about this already but um just like that's our baseline and from here we're going to get into some like kind of newer stuff we haven't got into yet now if i take this back to zero you don't have to follow along for this but if i take this to zero and then i preview this like you're not going to see any motion actually let me go back to soloing this layer so we don't have these other layers slowing us down but if i preview this you know we really don't have anything going on i guess there is some movement because um the camera is moving or whatever but like normally with form like nothing is is happening but if i take any of these fractal field values affect size affect opacity or displace if i take any of those to a non-zero number then we will have um automatic motion because this kind of like triggers the uh, fractal field to start working so if i take this place to like 10 or something like that then i preview this you can see that this is moving around this is displacing over time because of this flow evolution value so it's kind of like evolution fractal noise but it's like already animated for you and you don't have to send a keyframe so i i love the way this i wish they would have done this in the original um evolution fractal noise it's like so helpful just to have it automatically going. So if I want that faster, I could take it up uh, higher. If I want it to go slower, I could take it to a lower value. I could also use uh, flow X, Y, and Z, which are kind of like the drift that we looked at last week in particular. We could have like wind blowing left to right, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm going to displace this quite a bit again. And in order to make this look cooler, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add more resolution to these uh, particles, more particles. And so this starts to create on, uh, take on more like a silky look. So I'm gonna go back up into base form and I'm gonna increase particles in X, like, I don't know, maybe like 150. That looks like it might be kind of cool. Particles in Y, 150, and we could leave particles in Z set to three. So you see, remember, because the add blend, blend mode, all these particles are adding on top of each other. So we're getting a lot more light and vibrance. So like I was saying before about the particle color, we don't have to be very light about it. And as a matter of fact, I might go back into the particle section and click on the color swatch here and uh, desaturate that and drag that down so that when we do get these like pops of light, there's a little bit more contrast there. So again, I have this like very dull, like washed out color, but because of the add blend mode, it looks, it creates these cool little uh, patterns there. And I think I might want to go in and actually add even more resolution, but for now that's going to work. Um, one of the things I want to mention as well is that we have these uh, settings to control the fractal pattern itself. And this is a little more challenging because we can't actually see the fractal patterns. So we're kind of like wildly guessing about what those settings might look like. And they're not named like the other fractal pattern, uh, fractal noise settings we're used to seeing. But essentially, um, add, subtract, min, and max control the brightest parts and the darkest parts of the uh, invisible fractal field here. And gamma controls kind of like the midtone. Uh, so if I increase the gamma here, you can see that we're almost like decreasing the contrast in the uh, fractal noise. So we have more subtle patterns. So you see that that looks like there. So we have like, you know, more like watery type patterns rather than like these like really extremes big extremes uh, i'm going to undo that to get back to the default there and also i could also take this down and that increases the contrast and makes more uh intensity there i want to do that you can see that 
And also another important value here, and the only other one I'm gonna mention is the F scale. This controls like the size of the fractal noise displacement. So if I increase this, you'll notice we start getting, again, it's kind of like lowering the gamma. We get like much more intense and fine um, details in our fractal noise, so like a lot more intensity. And if we want this to be more like undulating and smooth, we could take this to a value below 10, like five, for example. So again, we have these like bigger patterns that are um, a little bit softer and smoother. So I'm gonna take this back to the default. Um, and uh, now I wanna talk about another type of fractal displacement inside a form, and that's the spherical fields. And it says spherical field, but if you open this up, you can see we actually have two spheres. Now, again, this is one of those things that might mess you up if you're brand new because, you know, I open this up, I maybe, maybe start cranking strength, and I really don't see much of a difference there at all. Well, what's happening here is that we have a sphere, and this invisible sphere, we actually have two of them, and this invisible sphere can like displace the particles. So it's like another fractal displacement, except instead of a fractal, it's actually like a, an invisible ball that we can have to like move around our particles. And then our particles can kind of like, you know, be pushed away and offended by the uh, <laughs> that sphere. But again, initially, you know, we crank up the strength and we can't see anything. So maybe we go over to the radius, we crank that up, but we're really not seeing much there, we can start to see something. But here's the deal, the, the, the issue is, is that um, we're, uh, well, in order to see this, we really gotta rotate this. So I'm gonna just go to Y rotation, you don't have to follow along here. But if I go to Y rotation, and I see this from the side, you could see that we have a, a sphere that's displacing things, but it's on zero, zero, like it's at the center of the coordinates of this thing. And we have these three sh sheets of particles on the z-axis and they're not touching the sphere. So what I want to do actually is change my size xyz where it's xyz linked. I want to change this to xyz individual so we can control the, the dimensions of this particle grid individually. So then I can go into size z and bring this down so then these layers of particles are going to be affected by the sphere. So now you can see more clearly what that sphere is doing. And I might even go into like 100, like smaller than that. So they're very close together on the z-axis and that sphere is gonna have much more of an impact. So now if I change my Y rotation to be like normal, you could see that this sphere is actually now making a difference. So if I turn down the strength, the size is still there. It's just not displacing the particles as much. And obviously we can go back to uh, our radius and increase this as well. And also we could scale this non-uniformly. So if we wanna scale this along the uh, x-axis or on the y-axis or whatever, then we could create these kind of uh, looks. And you could see already, you know, this, this kind of look that I have going on uh, in this example, that's really what it is. It's a spherical displacement with the fractal noise, with the fractal noise is making it, or the fractal fields making it all kind of like loopy and whatnot. And then that shape, that kind of like oval, that's being brought to you by the spherical field displacement. So that's how we can create these kind of like really cool looks there. And this looks a little ridiculous when I tone this down. But um, we can create some very beautiful effects by fiddling with these settings, like the feather, for example. You know, we might want to create a more subtle effect. So we turn up the, uh, the feather quite a bit, or we take this down and just, um, have very little feather, so we have this like very strong edge to our displacement, which could be really cool. Um, we could also again rotate this field too, which is could create some interesting um, results there. Yeah, so playing with these fields. Also, if you want to click the visualize field, you could temporarily see like the size of the uh, the sphere there, so it's, it helps for placement and whatnot. And also, the sphere has its own position. Each one has its own position. So I could actually move a sphere of displacement through particles and displace them that way. So, and, and we don't have to necessarily always have a sphere like right in the middle. We could just have it like on the edges and we'll see an example of that momentarily, but um, it can create some really beautiful effects. And um, I remember for a long time when this feature came out, that uh, ABC had this kind of like logo where like there was like these, you know, particles spinning around circle and uh, it was a really beautiful like a uh, logo uh, 
spot thing, a little logo treatment. And, um, you know, I don't know if they used form, but it was like this type of look and it's just a, a really fantastic um, thing, thing to play with there. So let's um, um, move on and I'm gonna close up the fields folder and I'm gonna open up uh, O2 Audio React. And uh, I'm gonna uh, go to O3 Audio Reaction Basics. So go ahead and double click that composition to open it up. And we basically, again, just have like the default settings of form. And we also have uh, just like a camera that's zoomed in a little bit. So these cam these particles are a little bit closer to um, the, uh, the viewer here. Uh, now, I don't know if this is going to work. So Nick, let me know if this is like, I don't know if you can hear this, but it's not playing is it playing on your system it's playing on my system um okay so hmm, i don't know how to uh get this to i don't know how to go, get this to a uh, play right so i'm gonna have to <laughs> i'm gonna have to like beatbox a little bit <laughs> so i love it can, can uh, you, uh, so on, yeah. on your layer could you put uh, like uh, press ll just so we can see the waveforms yeah that might, that might kind of give a visual there yeah good and then call. we could do the spectrum thing too yes i will um, get to that oh sweet don't spoil it nick don't spoil I'm it. i'm sorry i'm sorry i didn't say anything <laughs> just kidding <laughs> but I, I think everyone wants you to beatbox it anyways so okay all right <laughs> you're welcome um hopefully we can like edit this part out or like mute this or something like that um it's also gonna be super embarrassing because these tracks also use like a lot of like hi-hats and then like bass drum so that you can see the difference. So it's like, so there's, and then, then, then like right here, this little section is like a like bass drum, you know? Um, that's more, a little bit more embarrassing though. <laughs> I was expecting it would be, that's fine, we'll roll with it. Um, so I'm gonna open up the uh, base form with this form selected and I actually don't want, um, I think it's distracting with these multiple layers. So I'm gonna take particles and Z down to one and then I'm gonna go um, close that up, go to the particles section. Let's just make these like a little bit bigger. And actually, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to base form. I'm gonna make there be less particles. I'm gonna say like half, 35 and X and 35 and Y. So there's less particles. And um, yeah, make these a little bit bigger then. And then we'll take down sphere feather. This is not super important. It's just kind of like, let's just get something that's like a little bit more uh, pretty and obvious. Maybe take the size down to about six. We have a little bit of space there. Okay. So what I want is I want to use audio to control uh, various uh, properties of form. So Nick showed us brilliantly how to take other layers and use, you know, the color and other things to control the form particles. And then now we're going to look at how to use audio to control form particles. And this is kind of like what I was talking about in the beginning of why I have this like you know, obsession for uh, trap code form because you could do things like use other layers as layer map to control these different things. You could use audio. And I wanna make it like super clear that, you know, you can use audio to control these different properties and you don't necessarily have to hear the audio. Like those are two separate things, like whether you can hear the audio or not and what form is using two disconnected worlds. So you could bring in like a Taylor Swift song or a Rolling Stone song or whatever, something that's copyrighted. And, you know, you could use it to drive the animation of your, um, your particles and the end aud audience doesn't ever have to know that that's how you created all this complex animation. You can just use it as a tool to get these particles moving, which is really the most exciting part of this. So I'm gonna open up the audio react section. And this seems really easy, but this is so complicated. This, I mean, not complicated, but it's, it's really powerful. It gives you a lot of control. So I'm gonna go into, uh, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose my audio layer. And I also want to point out, though, is that in the audio react section for form, you choose an audio layer and you could only have one audio track per form. But then you could have five different reactors to that same audio track. So that one audio track can create five different, you know, things happening because of it. So I'm going to choose my um, form beat uh, one that that thing. Uh, and then I want to open up a reactor and kind of like before with maxing, mapping X and Y, nothing happens yet when you pick 
um, an audio track because you have to open up a reactor and determine like how are these particles going to react to that track. So I want to map this to, you can see all these different options here. I'm just going to choose particle size. So we're going to map this track to the audio size. So if I play this back now, so like you're missing some of that stuff. So like you're getting the and there's like the bass drum. So the bass drum hits, it's got like a lot of reaction, big reaction. But these little tiny baby hi-hats in the beginning aren't creating anything at all. And then you get like little open hi-hat, these little like waveforms right there, a little open hi-hat. And you're seeing a little bit more size, but not much. And then the bass drum hits and it's like, whoa, dear me, that's a lot of stuff going on. And what happens is, and the reason why this is happening is because in the audio reactor, you can specify the audio frequency range that you want to trigger a specific reaction. So you can have, you know, uh, particles disperse based on the base frequencies, and you could have particles uh, dis uh, be fractally displaced with the fractal field, um, just using when they're in a certain like high end range or whatever. So by default, the frequency is 100 Hertz, which is actually very low. And so um, our hi-hats barely have any, inf any information in those uh, that frequency range. But then once the bass drum hits, it's like, whoa, yeah, very like very triggered. So then we have these settings right here and these things right here are the, the, the magic. So the frequency range is very important. So again, in, in Hertz, the frequency of the range is gonna be looking for for this particular reactor. Also the width, like how far that's going to go out. So this is actually looking from a frequency range of like 50 to 150 because the width is 50. So 50 on either side. And then also the threshold, like how um, much do you have to get like accurate or how loud do you have to be in that frequency range in order to trigger something. So playing with all these, we can get like very customized. Now, as Nick mentioned, um, you know, we don't really have a way of seeing our audio frequency. We don't really have a way of like knowing that like this audio waveform bump here is uh, actually you know this particular frequency range because this is the waveform is just showing us volume so what i usually do is um well when i was on the mac i uh, use logic uh, more often with my after effects workflow and so you know logic has like an eq and shows you exactly where the ranges are and i would like write it down um and then also i use reason on a pc and uh, propeller heads reason has like a same type thing where you could see the eq so you know exactly where that is uh, but nick taught me this trick which is really cool that i hadn't thought of and nick you might want to get close to your um your uh microphone here because i'm going to ask you some some questions about this um, i'm close i i have a. Uh... There's a really important announcement that I should make right now. Alicia uh, has you booked on a tour after hearing your beatbox skills. So I just want to let you know, Chad. Oh, thanks, and, uh, Alicia. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you might want to contact. You might be booked next week. Uh, that's great. So check that out. And uh, uh, Nate, uh, Nate has just joined us and is very happy that he 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 was here to <laughs> hear your beatboxing. I think it made his day. Thank you, so, thank you, Nate. I, I appreciate that, everyone. Yeah. That's great. It's making this so much easier. <laughs> so, so golf clap. But no, I'm here by the mic. <laughs> um, okay, fantastic. Um, so I have audio, the audio spectrum effect, which is like a native After Effects effect, and it's you know you can use it to create these kind of cool looks or whatever. So I'm just going to change my audio layer to this uh, form beat one or whatever. And so now we're seeing kind of like a, a more graphical representation of um, what's going on in this beat. So we're seeing the hi-hats at the high end of the spectrum on the right side and the bass drum on the left. Now, I don't quite understand, and I played with this for a bit and I couldn't get it to work. So maybe Nick, you could help me out. Like I'm trying to figure out how to get this to show like the whole spectrum. Oh, I'm guessing sure. that this is Hertz. So this is yeah, like so, 20 so to I would like- just yeah. Go um, for the start frequency. This is what I usually do. So go uh, zero for the start frequency. Gotcha. Uh, or one. And then do uh, 200 for the end frequency. 200? Yeah, and set the bands, frequency bands, to 20. 20. So now okay. this, is, this is kind of a, this is not the entire spectrum, but let's just say that you were looking for something in the lower scale from zero to 200. If you play back right now, the second dot would represent 10. 
the third dot would represent 20, the fourth dot 30, 40, 50, 60, all the way to 200. So this is just like a way of visualizing like one uh, set of the frequency. If this was like more on the lines of a human oh, voice, okay. I would set like the start frequency to 500, maybe have the end frequency to 3000, and then just choose a number, like an even frequency band to figure out um, the frequencies in, in segments of 10 or 20. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. So you're just looking at one segment at a time. Yeah, just because like I, at least I find like the overall spectrum, you'd usually have harder hits at the the lower frequencies, at least for form. That's what I've been using. Mm. However, it, it allows you to see that spectrum or like almost like zoom in on it. And sometimes I'll even use like multiple audio spectrum. So I have like one for low, mid, and high, like an equalizer, but then you have like your frequencies for each of those channels just by duplicating the effect. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay, um, very interesting. So the frequency actually, oh wait, oops, what's going on here? Uh, frequency, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing this is like Hertz. So then if we wanted to see like the yeah. whole spectrum at once, then we probably want to go like zero to like 20K which is kind of like yeah. the limits of like human hearing. So then we're okay. seeing like right here, like this is, I don't know, maybe what, like 7,000? Like yeah, if you did like, uh, if you did your frequent, I wonder if you did your frequency bands to like, I guess like two, there's so many. Um, yeah, you're looking at kind of, you're having things hit all the way up to like 15,000. That's kind of amazing. And then if you were to do some math, we could basically take those frequency bands and try to make them divisible so that you see like one band for like 0, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, or 0, 500, oh, yeah. et cetera. So if you did like, yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking. So like 0, 500, 1,000, you're looking at like 40 bands or something like that. I'm probably way off, but this is just like my math on on the presentation stage, which is not good. Very interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, just to just to bring us all home, like the, the point of this audio spectrum is for us to identify where certain sounds hit in the audio spectrum. So that way we can go back into form and then put that here in the, the frequency there. Um, so if I went down to like, let's say I took the width down to like 10, and then the frequency bass drum might be a little bit lower. So let's say 60. Um, so then if I, so then we have like a bigger hit with those, those bass drums. Um, and I'm not sure why this, uh, that my hi-hats are still getting picked up. I think that's really interesting. Maybe I'll take width down to, oops, I'll not take it down to zero. Um, but. <laughs> It's kind of ridiculous. Um, part of okay. having so much fun. I know they're having a they're having a blast. Uh, but what's really cool is that um, I'm controlling this animation with just using um, the audio. I haven't set any keyframes or really done any work. You know, it's really just like the audio that's making all of this magic happen. Um, and I can do this uh, strength over thing. So if I click uh, over X, for example then we get access to a strength curve. So kind of like uh, Nick was mentioning earlier, um, I can say like, okay, I don't want that much uh, stuff on the left side, and then I want the right side to be really affected. So then when I go and play this back, so I'm only affecting that one side. So again, these little uh, curves here come in handy all the time all over the place and so again already you could start to see even though this is like one very very crude admittedly crude example we're starting to see you know that this has a lot of power we could do um some cool stuff with it i'm gonna turn uh, strength over to off and um i want to show you this other thing and this is kind of like this like blows my mind how this works but there's a delay and this is where it starts getting for me very complicated and and powerful but Right now, when these bass drum, when the kick drum hits, all the particles are affected at once. But we could also delay the reaction. 
So if like, say for example, the default delay reaction is X left to right. So what I can do is let's say I'll take the delay max to one second. So then what's gonna happen is that when these particles are impacted by the kick drum, it's not gonna be, they're not gonna be all hit at once. They're gonna be hit on the left side and it's gonna take one second to go all the way to the right. So then we have this. Look at that. That's so Isn't fun. That Isn't that cool? It's and, awesome. then it, and even just looking at this, like you have up to five reactors. So I mean, five essentially reactors. you could have that song referenced four more times and then like yeah. pick a different uh, frequency for each one of those. And then you have it affect even the size property slightly with different delay values. And you're going to have some pretty, pretty fun stuff. You're going to mention, have some pretty fun stuff. <laughs> some pretty fun stuff. Like, thank, thank you for taking the words out of my mouth. <laughs> you're going to have some pretty fun stuff. Um, <laughs> and I, I might take a straight down here a little bit, just a wee bit there. Uh, and then um, also what I'm going to do here is uh, well, I could say, let's say I'll take the delay direction to like outwards, for example, so which is like radially. So we create this. We have these kind of like, wee, these types of things. And so you could imagine creating these types of like rhythmic looks and feels, and these particles and these like cool wipes and stuff like that with this like hidden track behind the scenes. And no one knows that you're, you know, your animation's powered by Dr. Dre or whatever, and you didn't do anything. You're just like sitting there just being like, okay, I'm just gonna have this, all this cool stuff being controlled by animation, which is pretty fun. So again, we can go back to uh, the second reactor and map this to something else. So let's say disperse. And then maybe what we do is we take the frequency to like 1700. So it's like gonna, the hi-hats are going to impact this a little bit more. And kind of like what um, with what Nick was talking about earlier with the layer maps, we actually need some dispersion in order for um, the mapping to disperse to work at all. So I'm gonna go down to disperse and twist, bump up the disperse a bit here, just a little bit. And then when we play this back, so that's what's going on there in the little hi-hat. So, so then here the, the beat actually comes in and it's like doom, doom, doom. Okay, so that was my favorite beat of yours just there. Sorry, I had myself <laughs> muted. It was it was way better timed, but uh, that was great. Thank you, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm getting better at this as I go. I definitely have a lucrative career in this. I think in the beatboxing over over webinar. But anyways, you can see like the bass drum and then the like the little the little hi hat. So it's like bass drum with the particle size and then dispersion. So you can see that I mean we have this kind of complex animation. Yeah. And we could go and that's just like two reactors. And this is this was the uh the super watered down dumb example just to show you like what can be done in a in a clear way. But let's look at just very quickly a couple other examples. Um, oh, I can already tell this is gonna be much more embarrassing, uh, but let's just, let's just go for it. Um, I wonder, um, I'm gonna see if I can't take my headphones and put them over the mic so you could just like hear um, what this sounds like, you know what I mean? It's this cool. is weird, but let's just let's just try it. Whatever. Yeah, it's not coming through. Can, can you hear that at all? No. No. But okay. you know, I you you gave everyone their exercise files too. So I mean, if they opened up the map audio final, you guys could give that a playback uh, from the, oh, the yeah. Dropbox link. Why didn't I think of that? I'm sitting here making an idiot out of myself. <laughs> I could have said like use the files that you have. But um, then we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't hear your beatboxing. I just wanted to make sure that that uh, that was heard by everyone here. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh my goodness! Uh, and like this is good, like they're gonna play this at my funeral. Oh, remember that time when he was a stupid idiot and he was. <laughs>
beatboxing in a webinar when everyone already had the files. Okay, so um, in this example here, um, there's like these fractal noise strings, uh, or not fractal noise strings, form strings. And the left side of the audio reaction, I'll just like run through these really quick, um, just kind of like show you like what I did. The left side of these strings are being controlled by uh, the bass drum. And the only thing that they're controlling the property, the audio reactor that they're using is the Z displace. And they're also delayed. So then it creates this kind of look as I scrub slowly in time, it creates these kind of like moving waveforms. So we're going from, we're delaying it from left to right and we're using Z displace as the uh, audio reacts. So then we create these kind of cool sound waves. And the right side is being um, affected by the snare drum. And I have like the range is kind of like limited. So they're not like affecting each other, which is pretty cool. And then on the right side, we have um, the like a uh, fractal field. So the snare is triggering the fractal field and allowing those strings to be all like. Bleh. So um, when I play this back, So, yeah, it's kind of cool. A little like a uh, shuffly beat with a boom, boom, dang, 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 that kind of thing. Um, which you probably heard that fine. <laughs> but uh, okay, so bass drum, snare drum, that's kind of a fun thing. And uh, I want to go into this uh, digging deeper. Let's go into the digging deeper final comp. That's 05B. And this is one of my favorite uh, examples. This is more of like a a high art thing. It's, I don't know how useful this is because it's just kind of like a pretty thing. So I don't know if you're going to be like, you know, doing like an ESPN promo with something like this. But um, I th thought it was like a really fun use of audio reaction. So um, this is like the final, and there's like the cool like little piano thing. And Yeah. So um, again, that for those great. of you who don't have, thank you. For those of you who don't have exercise files, it's like there's like a low piano that's just like, blong, like chords, like low chords uh, for this part. So it's just like, blong. And then there's like a high pitched little thingy that comes in. And it's like, blink, 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 blink. Uh, and that's what's causing this other reaction. And you can see that there are two completely different reactions happening this kind of like initial wave for the base end is very very different than this kind of like ripple that happens when there's the super high end plinks and um so let me just take this apart and show you i mean you have the exercise files here but let me walk you through what i what i did first of all um there's kind of like a little uh gimmick going on here because i have a purple solid layer so like there's like a purple solid just kind of like overlays purple solid, no biggie. Um, but that do, does add a significant degree of sexiness to the whole thing. So if I take off the purple solid, um, then we see kind of like more of the bare bones of the trick. And the purple solid doesn't like animate or do anything. It just kind of shows up, but that's enough. And that's a great life lesson for everyone. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm gonna select the uh, the piano test here. And uh, that's, my, that's my layer. And I'm gonna open up the audio react. And I believe I used like all five reactors for this. So let me just like, again, just walk you through, break down um, what's what's going on here. So you'll notice that there are two frequency ranges in these uh, five audio reactors. Um, some are set to a frequency of 180 Hertz. Those are the bass notes, the big chord, like the bang in the beginning. And then there's also the uh, 1700 Hertz, the little plinkety plinks in uh, the, the background. They're like, ding, ding, bling, bling, bling. Um, and so that's uh, what, what these, uh, reactors are reacting to. So um, these bottom three here are, um, again, the, uh, the the base notes. And it's kind of interesting what's, what's happening here because there's actually two spherical displacements happening. So again, we're kind of bringing it or tying it all together here, all these, all these things. So um, we have a sphere one, and don't follow along here, but just to show you here, we have sphere one on the upper left, and so if I move this away, you can see what's going on there. And actually, I'll go back to the first frame so it's a little bit more clear. And then I also have the second sphere on the bottom right. And as I move that away, you can see 
what's going on. So, and then other than that, we just have a bunch of like horizontal strings of, of particles. That's that's really all this is. So it's super, super easy. But when we put in this sphere and that sphere and we combine those, then it currently creates this cool like shift. And so then what we do is like these, um, the, the base note chords are being affected by the, uh, uh, the base note chords are affecting the size of those spheres. And I have one reactor going from bottom to top along the Y axis, or sorry, sorry, from top to bottom on the Y axis, the sphere one size is going top to bottom. The sphere two size is going bottom to top. And then there's also a displacement along the X axis from left to right. So again, the sphere size on the top is going, uh, the size is being affected top to bottom, sphere on the right is being affected bottom to top, and the displacement's going from left to right. So now when you see that in motion, you could see ripples coming from the top going down, ripples from the bottom going up, ripples from the left going to the right. And because they're in add mode, we get these beautiful ripples, these beautiful like uh, aftershocks as these uh, delays kind of like wrap around each other. So just taking these simple strings, these form strings, you can see how, how basic this is. And then, but all this displacement, because of the audio creates these beautiful looks. And then for the high end frequencies, um, I just basically have uh, that's mapped to a fractal and it's back to map to particle dispersion. And both of them are Y bottom to top. So like they're in sync with each other. So then when the little plinkety plinks happen, from the bottom to the top, we have, uh, again, fractal displacement and dispersion going together from bottom to top. And it creates these kind of cool ripples that are displacing or dispersing and uh, allowing fractal displacement to kind of go through the thing as well. So um, I hope that you go into these uh, projects, these comps and tinker around with them a little bit because the, the power to make art like this is just incredible. And, you know, you can't, same thing with like layer maps and, and with audio reaction, you can't do this stuff on your own. You can't make this stuff like with keyframes or like cleverly using like the curves or whatever. Like you really need the power of other layers, but the, the design of form is so brilliant that they realize, okay, we just have static particles. What can we do? Well, we could use other layers, audio, color, alpha, whatever, to drive other properties. So this is where you take form to the next level by using other properties and create things like this that are just astounding that you wouldn't be able to create otherwise. And again, in the final comp, no one has to hear that audio. You could just use it to control the audio or control the animation, the dispersion, the fractal noise, whatever it is, and create some really beautiful results. So anyways, Nick, I'm gonna turn it back over to you for the next thing. I have like another little like a uh, bit of things, a little like you know, post whatever, whatever, but I'm going to turn it over, over to you for the, uh, the next, um, things and we'll finish up and I'll finish up in a sec. Cool. Um, funny enough, that was uh, actually my last thing was the layer maps, but there were some questions in the thread yeah. and I thought I would go over a few things and actually add to something that you were just showing in terms of audio reaction. So and also just giving an, an idea of something else as well. So, um, I one there was one question a little bit earlier just about um, how do you bring in 3D objects to form, and I think we showed that Chad in in particular, but we didn't show it in form. So I thought I would just do that. Okay. And uh, let me grab here, and then I'll, I'll go on to something in a question of about audio reactions and some further uses of it in within form. So sweet. Uh, just like particular, if you head into the designer. And we go to the type. And by the way, there's no project for this, so just follow along with a blank um, form or like your default form settings. And if you can, just find a piece of audio on your system to follow along because I'm sort of doing this on the fly. In uh, the block within form, here's your option for a 3D model. And just like particular, we have a whole library of 3D models that you can use and reference for your base form, which is pretty sweet. In fact, I'm going to choose this sphere strips. I'll choose OK. And all of a sudden we have that mapping of particles to that sphere. 
Now, one thing I really do like about form, if we look down at the actual model settings, you can choose from the different types of geometry to have your particles born from on a 3D object. So that's edges, uh, vertices, faces. And for any reason that you wanna map it to something like faces, but it appears like it's too dense, you can also go down to the particle density and bring that down to get a different look there. And in fact, like setting it to something really low here creates a little of an interesting look there with uh, with our particles across this uh, this sphere. So that's essentially the 3D model workflow. However, you can do the exact same things in form that you can do in particular. So we can work with Cinema 4D files. And in week two, I showed a Mixamo trick where we brought in a Mixamo character, took that Mixamo character, brought into Cinema 4D, added some motion capture data, and then we referenced that uh, inside a particular and had a trail of particles. You could do that exact same thing inside a form and use its engine for things like kaleidoscope like we've seen, not to mention some other features like taking your particles or taking your 3D object and having those particles be dispersed. And then even taking that dispersion and using a layer map or some sort of curve map to control how that dispersion, dispersion takes place across your 3D object. The other thing, you know, when it comes to 3D models, and we talked about this last week, Chad, is how they can be used uh, in a fluid simulation. We could do the same thing here inside a form where you could take a 3D model, which just has a lot of density, and from that, tell it to take parts in a fluid motion simulation. So I'm just going to the fluid block to turn that on. I'll actually use my camera tools with the C key inside the designer to zoom out on the scene. Bring this a bit down and let's uh, play that back. And look at that kind of beautiful fluid motion of our 3D system. The great part about this chat, like there's no birth of particles at the beginning, right? So you get to see the original shape, which I really like. And then it sort of looks like it's morphing or changing into something else, which is kind of sweet. And then you have the whole interaction that you can use with your fluid-based particles. And just like particular, where you have multiple fluid forces that you can use, you've got buoyancy, a vortex swirl, vortex tube, and also this other one, which is called none. And none, uh, let me pause playback. If I go to the beginning of the project, we should see that it's just literally going to keep your particles still and not take part in a fluid force. Cool. I am going to increase the buoyancy here on the buoyancy and swirl system. And in fact, also just add some random swirling of these particles. So I set that to a value of 30. And I'll bring down the swirl scale to increase this further. Uh, we'll see something kind of cool. I set it to two and just notice that a smaller swirl scale actually um, affects these particles more ver in terms of swirling than a larger swirl scale. I draw this comparison to fractal noise, Chad, like where you have a, a scale, and if you increase the scale of the fractal noise, it actually affects the layer or item less versus if you break it down, it affects it more. Mm. So yes, yeah, so we have these uh, this kind of burst of, of particles here with fluids. So that's kind of cool. And I'm gonna, why not just duplicate this? This is one of those features that's only available in the designer where you can take your master form system and you can duplicate it. And I'll take the second system now, I'll stop playback, uh, just move to the beginning of the project and make it higher in the scene. So let's go with negative 750 in this case. Oh, I uh, make that negative 900. To add a little bit of differentiation, I'll take the second um, 3D base emitter 
let's just choose a different preset because there's quite a few here in terms of models that we can choose. Chad, what, uh, what's catching your fancy? For 3D models? Um, I don't know. Let's see. What are we doing? Fluids? What are fluids? Um, yeah. Rounded cube would be like good surface area, but sphere array would be cooler. I don't know. Let's go with sphere array. All right. You said cooler, okay. so I'm going to go with... I hope so. <laughs> We're going to see. This is the moment of truth, but there's the sphere array. I'm just moving around the scene with, uh, scene with my camera tools. And the one thing we want to do here in the fluid system of the secondary system is add a negative buoyancy value. And all of a sudden, just like before, okay, it's a little bit too strong, the buoyancy. Um, I'm going to lower it, but there is interaction going on with these two particles. In fact, it might be better. Love Chad, I have to, I have to ch change the 3D model. I'm sorry. That's fine. That's fine. Whatever. <laughs> Actually, Nate uh, made a comment in the the questions, which is like really awesome. I was going to ask you like what purpose none serves in the fluid motion, because and like none doesn't turn off fluid motions. You can enable fluid motion and no. set it to none. And uh, Nate was saying that the point of that is that you could have like if you have multiple systems, you have one that just kind of like doesn't um, move or interact. You could just have other fluids interact with that. Yeah, so, yeah, it's pretty yeah, like that. It's, so you can see here that these particles start to to move, and then when they get in close proximity, that's when they lift up the second system. Yeah, none is so awesome cool. for that. And you know, you could actually just turn off a second system, have it set to none, and I think the first system should still interact with it. Let's. I just want to see how that looks. Could, the same motion is going to still exist with the first system. It's still interacting with that second system, believe it or not, which is pretty cool uh, for like your another, particles. Another question, another question, Ryan asked, like, how do you make your particles go from scattered to 3D object? And so I would say that you could either do a time reverse on the layer um, if you're doing fluid effects, or you could use disperse, the disperse, uh, increase the disperse over time, keyframe that. Um, or use like layer maps to control dispersion or audio or whatever. Um, yeah, but I don't all think those... there's a way to, to like gather fluids, right? Is there? No, I don't think. Yeah, it's not going to go back to the base yeah. form because it's already being emitted. He would have to essentially do a fluid simulation and then throw it into a pre comp and then time reverse it. Yeah. That's okay, how that's I would do it. Yeah. Um, there was another question from uh, Alicia. Regarding, and I, I had never thought about this until now, and I did a little test while you were doing some instruction, Chad. And this was the question was, do fluids work with um, with audio? And they do. I could not believe this. Um, Wait, what? Yeah, they work with audio reactions. So I could, I was just like, really? Because inside of particular, what happens is certain simulations get turned off, right? However, uh, I have a piece of music here. Let's see how this, hopefully, can, can you guys hear this? Everybody say no. <laughs> Chad, could you hear that? I actually can't. You can't? So I oh, hoping, okay. I was hoping that everyone would say no so that you have to beatbox. Alex, it looks like an Eminem track, all the better. Okay, um, so that was my attempt at <laughs> This, I'm going to try to sh shift, actually command scrub this. Does anyone hear that? Maybe not. Let's go with a no. Okay, it's a no. There's music in my timeline. You're just going to have to believe me. And it's doing stuff. <laughs> and I'm just going to go to form. I'm going to go to the master form. Uh, here's the audio react section. And I'm just going to reference that waveform. Or sorry, that song, which is in a wave format. I'll let... Uh, map this to particle size we'll leave it at the default frequency chad and i'm just going to increase the strength to like 500 that might be a little just a little strong but it will let's make it 300 i'm going to go strength over x you already saw a change happen there didn't you if you didn't i'm going to go back to the master form go within the particles i uh, set this to a value of five and then just add some randomness here, like 
25. Uh, maybe actually even just map it over X and play with some randomness of those sizes. Anyhow, I don't know if you can see this. Do you see how they're getting bigger in size in both areas? And that's because of the audio. Just awesome. to show this even further, like I'll increase the strength to like 700. And now they're involved in that um, fluid force as well as you have an audio reaction. And you can take this, of course, and then let's just choose a different reaction like disperse over X. And like Chad taught us earlier, pop inside the uh, disperse value and maybe add something so that those particles actually do disperse. They're not really dispersing, are they, Chad? I'm not seeing. Let me try that again. Dispersion. Did I do disperse over X? Let's go with like 100. Maybe it's the amount. The um, Well, if you're looking for the delay, then you want to increase the delay max. But the strength over, if it doesn't have a strength curve, then it won't do anything. It is kind of dispersing. It dispersed on an earlier example. There we go. There is some dispersion happening. But uh, it did work in an earlier example. I tried that too, and I was like, wow, that's pretty cool. You could see when I turned it off that uh, disperse does have an effect yeah. on the particles. Just not uh, getting it maybe based on the frequency that's currently selected. Maybe if I set it to something like 1,000, it would change. But then I could rely on your advice, Chad, and use the audio spectrum in order to do this. But yeah, just so cool that you could use these audio reactions inside fluid uh, simulations. It's, I think it opens up a whole other world to form. Awesome. Now, I know you had something, a couple other things to finish off with. So let me head it back to you. Sweet. Show my screen. Show my face. Um, all right. Nick, you see in the, uh, the old uh, screen there? I do. OK. Um, a couple of things really quick, just bells and whistles. Uh, if we actually not in bells and whistles, but these are part of bells, and, whatever. Uh, inside the Chad folder, inside the comps folder, inside the O3 uh, shading folder, open up the O6 uh, lights composition. By the way, Nate was saying that he wants to see like a a beat ba beatbox battle between us. So maybe we have like a bonus week seven <laughs> where we do audio react and we just like explain it. <laughs> oh, that's great. Anyways, okay, so let's talk about using uh lights in in form and oftentimes we can create much better composites and also just more beautiful looks if we're using lights and shadows uh in our uh, comps with after effects and with, with form uh, but even if you're not trying to composite form into a, a live action scene like it still helps to kind of create dimension and beauty and things like that when you're playing with like lights so there's a little bit of a trick to it i'm going to um very quickly run through this i'm going to go um again in the 06 lights comp i'm going to select the form and i'm going to go to the base form I'm actually going to change this to a, a 3d model um in the base form choose a 3d model and we're going to click choose model to open this up and then i want to use a cone and in the geometry section at the top cone click ok and there's a cone and then i want to change the uh, particle itself i want to use a sprite so i'm going to go into the particle and i'm going to change the particle type to um, sprite actually let's just do sprite colorize and i'm going to it should go away that's normal behavior makes sense i'm gonna click on choose sprite and then i'm going to go into um 3d geometric shapes and i'm going to get let's do sphere four sphere four there inside the 3d geometric shapes click ok and then we'll have a cone made of the little spherical sprite things eventually when it finishes loading. It's gonna be worth it, I promise, it's gonna be amazing. Oh, and Chad, just uh, Nate brought up a great point here about the, the fluid system. 
Okay. Uh, just in terms of dispersing, and that is that the fluid sim only samples particle position at frame zero uh, in terms of um, the, that means that the dispersed sort works with fluids, but only on the first frame before the oh, simulation okay. takes over. Hence why some of it might have not showed correctly. So that's good to know. Thanks, Nate. Okay. Yeah, thanks, buddy. It's good to have you here. Um, let's see. Okay, so what I want to do here, like this is like too dense. We're not really seeing anything. So I want to go into my um, base form settings, 3D model settings, and maybe let's take this to um, like 50% or something like that. So we have like much less particle density, having a lot less. I'd even take that down lower than that. Yeah, this is pretty ridiculous. Um, yeah, or maybe let's do vertices. Yeah, we'll do vertices there. Take that back up to 100%. That'll be nice. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so then I'm gonna go into the particle section, increase the size, so then I could see those actual 3D balls there that aren't 3D, but they're still images that look like they're 3D, which is pretty cool. So now you'll notice that I have a point light in my scene, but if I move my point light around, nothing is happening. And so particular, I believe, you know, you just put a light in the scene and it responds to the light and form uh, doesn't do that by default. And actually what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna sample a color from the scene. I'm gonna go to the color swatch in the particle area, click the eyedropper tool next to color and sample one of the greens from the background so that we have like uh, a green. And then I need to go into the texture here. Let's see, where's my, uh, I got Sprite colorized, but it's not colorizing. What am I missing? Oh wait, there we go, it just took a minute. Um, okay, so if, what I wanna do now is I want uh, to, uh, have this respect my light. So I'm gonna go into the shading section and I'm gonna turn shading from off to on and then it will use the light in my scene. Now, oftentimes what happens is this, where you turn on shading to use your light and then by turning on shading, it actually gets pitch black and you can't see anything. And that's because the light might not be in the right spot. So if I select my light and on the Z axis, maybe we can click and drag this and move this. Well, then once we get it in the right spot, um, eventually we will move it in the right spot. Um, or, or not, maybe. Um, I'm not sure why this is not uh, in alignment there. Uh, but that's oftentimes the issue is that we're not, um, our light is not aligned with our particles. And I'm not sure what's going on here with my light. Maybe I'll delete that and then try to create a new light. There we go, point light. Yeah, maybe I'll sample like a warm color from the scene. Hmm, well, that's that's not working. So, so that it can be tricky for this very reason. Maybe I need to make sure that my form is actually like um, same Z axis as my point light maybe. Yeah, well, for some reason that's not uh, it's not showing up. Um, so what I might need to do, and I don't know if this will help in this case, but nominal distance is like the kind of like the light span. So sometimes that needs to be cranked up a bit. Oh, there we go. There we go. I just need to turn up my my nominal distance. And so another thing that I could do too here is like you know bring this closer and now bring this forward. Now that I could kind of see what's going on with the nominal distance. And then that's way too much. So I could go back to nominal distance and then tone that tone that down. But you can see that we have now this like lighting and the difference that that makes in creating, you know, a little highlight on this scene and the difference that that makes in the realism of this shot. Um, we are running out of time. I just want to mention very briefly that we can actually use a reflection map. Um, and also we can play with uh, diffuse and you know ambient and specular and all these things that we're kind of like used to playing with. Ambient will only work if you have an ambient light in your scene, but then this can be controlled through form, which is pretty cool. 
Um, there's also another thing called a shadow lit, which is pretty cool. Let me see if I can't get this um, working here. Um, if I choose shadow lit and turn this to on, by default what happens is the particles will self shadow a little bit. It's almost like ambient occlusion. But then if I actually name a particle or a light, if I name it shadow, then it will use that light as um, a shadow lit. And so then it will use that light that I've named shadow to create self shadowing. So the, the form particles will create shadows on each other. Um, and again, we're running out of time, but you could also use uh, reflection maps. And I was gonna go through this other example, but we're we're, we're out of time. So um, anyways, you can get in and play with that. And that's how that stuff um, that's how that stuff works. So, uh, anyways, that's all I had, uh, Nick, you can take it back over. That's awesome, Chad. And you have, everyone has this example right in the three folder as well. So they can kind of take a look at it and uh, work with those shadowlets. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And then the, uh, Nate was just mentioning, uh, another thing to do on top of the nominal distance was like just move oh, the light yeah. to like the exact coordinates of the world um, to zero, 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 I guess, in the trap code world. I should have just like uh, read what Nate said and that would have saved me like several minutes of like trying to <laughs> fumble around oh, and troubleshoot. It happened at the exact same time. So when you had solved it, he had like literally put it in the thread. So it was just, it, okay, was, okay. Yeah, it was symbiotic in terms of the timing. We um, want to thank yeah, everyone thank uh, again for, for coming this week. I can't believe it's the end of week four, Chad. And uh, I know. next week, next week we're kind of taking a little bit more of a back seat because we have two special guests uh, from the Maxon training team, uh, Darren Frankowitz, Frankowitz, as well as uh, Ellie Wade. And they're gonna talk to us all about particles, but in Cinema 4D. And we're gonna be there to try to bridge the gap between the two applications of how we can think about them inside of, uh, Cinema 4D, so we're pretty excited. And uh, we're gonna throw Chad on the spot to do some demos on X particles. <laughs> Please don't do that. <laughs> but no, this has been so fun. And if anyone else needs the link, uh, it's down within the questions. Join us next Thursday, same time, same bat channel from uh, 10 Pacific to 12, uh, 12 Pacific or one Eastern to three Eastern. So thanks so much. And we'll see you guys next week. Awesome. Really Thanks for joining it. us, everybody. Have a good one. Happy playing. Bye, everybody. <laughs>